Hello and welcome. I'm Arumba. Thank you for joining me. This is going to be a mini tutorial on how to use the ruler designer in Crusader Kings 2. So I am going to pick any person at random and illustrate some of the features that you can use with the ruler designer. So let's go ahead and modify King Harold II of England. I'm going to click the button here for the ruler designer. Keep in mind the ruler designer is DLC or downloadable content. Um, you have to pay for it. I believe it's five or ten dollars, uh, depending on when you buy it. You can usually find a Steam sale. I think it's worth buying, um, just because it's it's fun, fun to use. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this than I would if I were actually going to go and play the game. I want to be thorough. So we have here the ability to alter our character's appearance. Um, at the top, though, we can also modify his ethnicity. This is uh, just the graphical culture. This right here does not change your character's actual. Um, his actual culture or religion. This just changes how he looks. So if you want, you could go through and you could make, say, an Iranian who is Saxon. Hopefully that makes sense. So, um, you've got it separated by the different groups, Altaic, Arabic, East Slavic, West Slavic, South Slavic, etc. You can find the type that you want. There's a lot of different options, although most of them are going to look at, you know, some of them are going to look fairly similar. So let's go with, um, let's say I wanted to make someone who is uh, Mesoamerican. Ooh, that guy looks nice. Um, we can modify the eyes, we can modify the nose, mouth, chin, neck, cheeks, ears. Not very many options for eye color with this character, but there may be more with others. Hairstyle, we have 11 different hairstyles for this ethnicity. Only one hair color probably just based on the origin of that religion or that, that uh, ethnic group. Seven beard options with this character. Actually, it looks like this is not working for this type. Must be because of the ethnicity that I've chosen. Now, for visualize, we can choose the clothing. Um, we can see what the clothing would be. This does not change the way your character's clothes will look in-game because the clothing that is worn is dependent on the character's station and their job. Like. A chancellor is going to have a certain outfit. This would probably be the outfit you wear if you are a king at war, etc. But you can see kind of how your character would look while you're, while you're going through here. You can also toggle the different headgear. Um, this would be like someone who's just a, uh, this is either the spy master or someone who is just a person in the court. Um, let's see if we can find another one that's familiar. That looks like your marshal. That would be like the bishop type guy. We can also see what your character is going to look at each age. Again, you don't change his age here. This just shows you what he will look like when he hits that age. So you can kind of fiddle with it on more than one age group. You can also see what the different backgrounds would be. And the background is going to be dependent on what your character is doing. So that, you know, if he's at C, this is likely going to be the background that you'd see. Modifying it here does not change the way that it's going to look while you're playing the game. Here's a randomized button, but it kind of defeats the purpose, I think, unless you're just trying to uh, use it to start off. But if you click it, it changes everything, except for the ethnicity. So you can just you know, randomly go through a few times and pick something that you'd like. Now, the coat of arms, this is something I think a lot of people get confused by because you spend a ton of time on this, and the coat of arms has really nothing to do with any visuals that you're going to see in the actual game, like your... Your coat of arms is not what your men are going to carry around as their, their flag, their standard. The coat of arms is what you, you see next to your dynasty. When you're looking at the, the dynasty view, and for instance, if I'm creating the, uh, the Salisbury dynasty, then I'm choosing what our coat of arms is for the dynasty. So this is more of a personal touch type thing. If you want to spend a lot of time on it, or if you have a certain style that you like, feel free to spend a lot of time on it. But again, it doesn't impact anything as far as gameplay goes, and it's purely flavor. So do what you like here. A lot of options. You can do single, uh, a single, single shield or split shield. Um, there's you know, four slots, different colors that you can use. You can put different emblems on either side. You can play around with this and really create some pretty crazy custom options. You can see here we've got like an eagle a full eagle and then a tiny eagle and it, it's a lot of options. So, attributes. This is the one that I think gets people the most confused. You would think that with the ruler designer you could just cheat and just do whatever you want. 
But that's not really how they made it. What happens with the ruler designer is that each trait either gives you points or takes away points. The points determine your age. So for instance, um, I can modify the name um, and the dynasty name. I could just you know, say first name Arumba, second name um, of Let's Play, or, wh or whatever. You, know, you could just, I mean, you could choose any name. You can determine here if you want them to be married or not. It doesn't actually do much aside for cost you two points to be married. I would almost never recommend you take this just because um, you know, you'd rather marry for an alliance or marry for stats yourself. There's no real guarantee that the person you're married to is going to have good traits. Now, culture and religion. I want to talk about this for a moment because it's, it's quite important. Now, I chose the King of England as my character to modify. If I chose a different culture here, let's say I chose East African, I made myself Ethiopian. I can do that. That's fine. I will be the Ethiopian King of England. The problem with that is that I am going to get foreigner penalties with every single person in my realm. All of England over here is going to be upset with me for being a foreigner. Also, because I am Ethiopian, my cultural building is not going to be the English longbows. It's going to be whatever the Ethiopian cultural building is. It's always based on the top liege, which would be me in this case. Now, the problem with choosing a foreign culture that's far away from wherever they're supposed to be is that unless they are bordering the correct culture, like let's use the Holy Roman Emperor as an example. Uh, let's look at the culture mode right here. So let's say, for example, I wanted to play as the uh, Bohemia, King of Bohemia, but I don't really like to play as, um, I don't want to be Bohemian. You know, I want to be Polish. Okay. Well, Bohemia and Poland border each other, so Polish culture would spread into Bohemia as I play. But if, on the other hand, if I'm wanting to play as Polish and I choose, say, over here in the Catalan area, because there's no bordering Polish counties, there's not going to be any Polish spread of my culture. So I'm always going to have that foreigner penalty. Religion is not nearly as complicated as the culture. You can convert the religion no matter where you go. Um, but just be aware that if you choose you know, a heresy, if you want to start off Lollard, then um, you're going to be dealing with heretic people. People are going to gonna have a minus 35 opinion malice of you because you are a heretic. Education, you have to choose one. The education trait um, at the base level costs you zero <coughs> for everything except for the martial education. The martial education costs five because it does give you uh, plus five health, or plus 0.5 health, excuse me. Generally speaking, um, the extra stats that you get from choosing a higher education level almost perfectly weigh against the extra stats that you get. So for instance, the gray eminence trait, education trait, costs 14 points. Naive appeaser is free, gives us minus one martial, one plus one diplomacy. If we were to add up the extra stats here, we get an extra one intrigue, an extra nine diplomacy, so we're at plus 10, an extra two learning, so now we're at plus 12, and then we get plus 10% fertility. Now if we go back to fertility, we can see that every 5% fertility costs one age or one point. So essentially, to go from the na naive appeaser to gray eminence is 14 points, you could get the exact same thing by just building it into your base stats. The only reason you'd want to take, say, the higher level education as a starting character is if you plan on educating your heir yourself and you want a better chance of passing on that education trait. A gray eminence is more likely to pass on gray eminence than an IAV Peaser is to pass on gray eminence. It's not a 100% chance. In fact, even a gray eminence is possibly going to give off a... Uh, of a different education trait altogether. It's very rare, but it can happen. So, generally, I go with, I don't usually, I like to have the higher base stats, personally. Um, or one thing I like to do <coughs> is if you take the, the martial skill, the martial education trait, you have a chance of improving this in every battle. So, you could take, say, Misguided Warrior, and then over time, being in, in combat, you would improve your martial ability, which just increases the skill.
Now, this part's pretty simple, but I do like to point out here, it says shift click for 5x effect and control click for 10x effect. This is pretty nifty if you want to be able to move quickly instead of having to click, 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 click. Um, <clears throat> health. Now, health is a trait that's kind of confusing because with health, um, you would, you would, at first, my first assumption was that if I doubled my health, if I put it at 10, my character would live twice as long. Uh, that's not how it works. Um, you have a mean time to happen, uh, MTTH. You have a percent chance every year to die. And the higher your health is, the lower that chance to die is. But it is, it is calculated on a curve. So the older you get, it's exponentially more likely that you will die. So having 10 health at age 80 is basically the same thing as having 5 health at age 80. You're going to die. I mean, you will die soon. So don't worry too much about stacking health. It's not going to increase your longevity by very much. But what it can do is if you give yourself, say, one extra health, you don't have to worry so much about getting wounded or maybe you know, catching an illness. An illness isn't going to kill you when you're 30 if you've got that extra one health to kind of compensate for it. Although each point one health costs you one point. Fertility, I would not usually spend any points on. You're going to have more than enough kids, especially because when we get to this traits section, you can just take some traits that are going to give you increased fertility for free. So don't usually want to modify that. And again, unless you really feel the need to have an heir right away, um, I wouldn't generally take a son. They cost five points. Daughters are five points as well. Oh, no, they're two points. Now let's talk about traits. Um, <clears throat> Every trait that you choose is going to either cost you points or give you points. So negative traits, bad traits, give you more points to spend on stats. So you can see that how much it costs you right here. For instance, stressed costs you, uh, it gives you negative 14 or gives you 14 points. The effect of being stressed is that you have minus one intrigue, minus one stewardship, minus 10% fertility, and minus one health. If we add up those negative effects, minus one, plus minus one is minus two. Fertility counts at 5% per point, so that's four. And then health is one point per point one health. So it's a flat cost. You are losing those traits, therefore you gain 14 points. That's how that calculation works. It's not always perfect, but that is how this one is calculated. Depressed is probably gonna come out to about the same. Yep, just a quick look over it, 15 points makes sense. Lunatic, this one is an arbitrary number based on the fact that lunatic is a very bad trait to have. Possessed, seven, again, it's somewhat arbitrary. These ones are probably gonna be based on the stat effects. Diplomacy, yeah, health, minus two. You could be a leper, give yourself a ton of points, and then just bump up your health by two to offset it. This is the effective health, 5.7. That's the base health. This is the effective health after traits. You could also bump up your fertility to offset that leprous trait. Generally, what I like to do is just pick a couple bad ones, like maybe wounded, because it's easy to recover from. I don't like to usually take maimed or infirmed or incapable. Incapable will cause you to have a regent. Um, drunkard's not too bad. But some of the other notable ones I want to talk about is that if you are playing as a Catholic ruler, it's usually pretty, it's kind of gamey, but if you start off the game excommunicated, you get 20 extra points. You can spend those on diplomacy to offset the cost. And then because the game doesn't calculate your income until a few uh, weeks or months into the game, you can, you can pay the Pope one gold or 20 gold, I think it is, to, to lift the excommunication. So if you want to be gamey, that's one way to do it. Um, it's possible. Be cautious with taking things like um, these congenital traits. These hearts let you know that it's congenital, meaning it's inheritable. If you make your character club-footed, it's very likely to persist in your dynasty. Although you can easily handle one congenital trait, you definitely want to avoid having a lot of them. Now, for some strange reason, it costs one point to take stutter, which I think is actually a a mistake. I don't really understand why it would cost you to be stuttering. Oh well. Attractive costs 16. So we're now seeing these were all, most of them were negative points. These ones cost points. 
Attractive is good for um, for females because it makes all men like them. Not as important for men, for, uh, for men because it doesn't really matter if women like you. They're going to like you enough anyway. It's usually the male rulers you have to worry about. Genius is a great trait to take because it costs 30 points, but it gives you 5 of everything. So it gives you 25 stats, and then there's only 5 extra points that are unexplained. Well, those 5 extra points is that it gives you a plus relations with everybody. Everybody likes geniuses, so it's a, it's a permanent plus relations boost with everyone. So it's a good trait to have. Um, quick doesn't give the relationship bonus, and it only costs uh, 15, gives you 3 of everything. This one, if you're going to take this, if you're planning on boosting your base stats by three, then just take quick. Saves you a bunch of clicks. Don't ever take slow or imbecile. These are congenital, and they'll, they'll, they're terrible. Really bad. Uh, imbecile and inbred, I think, almost makes you die instantly. Actually, it's inbred. Minus 1.5 health. Strong is congenital. Notice the heart. This is a good trait to take if you can afford the points. Strong gives you plus two health which is equivalent to 20 points worth of health. It also gives you 10% fertility, which is equivalent to 2 points, 1 diplomacy, 2 martial. The reason strong is so expensive is because people admire strong characters. So it's, again, it's going to give you a relationship bonus with most of your vassals. Weak is negative points. Um, it does affect your health, but you can easily offset it just by giving yourself an extra health point. The problem with weak is that it does make characters like you less. Never, ever, ever take celibate as your ruler designer. This is going to end your game. You can't have kids. Um, unless you want to gamble it and just say, give me a son, and let's just hope that he's a good, a good heir. You have no control over his stats and really no control over what happens with him. But um, you could take celibate if you did that. And it only gives you 20 points, though. Now, if you're concerned about having kids, just take hedonist. It costs negative 3 and gives you plus 20% fertility. Cost you a little bit of piety, but you can have more kids this way. These here are lifestyle traits. Scholar, gardener, mystic, impaler. They give you a couple stats. The only reason you'd want to take these over um, you know, base stats would be if, if you are interested in some of the events you can get from having them. It does give you a relationship bonus with people who have the same um, lifestyle event or the life, same lifestyle trait. And now we're down to the seven deadly sins, or seven virtues. Lustful is negative points because it costs you piety, but it gives you 20% fertility. So if you're worried about kids, take lustful. You can take lustful and then add six more points to diplomacy, for instance. And that's a net, net neutral. Greedy is negative one points, gives you more income, etc. for these traits. Now, onward further down here, you've got just um, these ones are really going to modify how your vassals feel about you. Never take content if you want to do plots, because you cannot plot oftentimes when you are content. You can't plot to take your lieges' uh, titles. You can't plot to kill as many people, um, because you're content with life. Arbitrary is negative, because people have a, an opinion malice with people who are arbitrary. Just costs 13, because people admire someone who is just. Zealous is a ton of monthly piety. <clears throat> and now these traits here are Muslim specific. You can put them on Christians, but don't do that because they don't make any sense. Um, for instance, I've created here, this is a, a Ethiopian lollard who's a mujahid. It'll give you, he's a veteran of a jihad. How that could possibly happen, I don't know. Just right click to remove. So if you're playing as a Muslim, you might want to take that. I would not take Crusader or that one that we just talked about at the very beginning of the game because no Crusades have happened. If a Crusade hasn't happened, uh, where is Crusader? Most of the benefits of Crusading <coughs> cannot happen. Did I just skip over it? I must have. Most of the benefits of being a crusader cannot happen until the first crusade because, here we go, right here. Because what it does is everyone else who's a crusader gets a positive relationship bonus with everyone else who's a crusader. If you're the only crusader because a crusade hasn't happened, then you're basically paying 29 points for a trait that doesn't do anything yet. So I wouldn't take it at the beginning of the game. Um, these are Muslim only. Wouldn't really take these because you can just go on a Hajj, 
hajaj as soon as the game starts. Um, this will happen when you go on the hajaj. Now this, the uh, Mirza and Saeed, I don't understand why they're free, but if you take Saeed and you're playing as a Muslim, everyone will have plus 10 relationship bonus with you, so it's kind of cheating. It makes, everyone, it makes the game easier. Um, if you're concerned about difficulty, maybe take that when you're playing as a Muslim. Pilgrim, um, it's, it's an unused trait. You can just take it to give yourself extra piety. It does cost points. There is no pilgrimaging in this game yet. And Scarred is a trait that you get after being wounded and surviving. So that's basically the traits. What I usually like to do is I like to either play one of two ways. Either I play with a very, very young character with fantastic stats with the idea being that I'm going to play him forever and get some very high uh, long reign benefits because I can play him for maybe 50 years, try to do a lot of conquesting in the beginning of the game. The other way I like to play is to take someone with fantastic stats um, who's a little bit older the highest you can go is age 50. And then understand that I'm going to try to groom an heir as quickly as possible because this guy's going to die soon. So I like to play one of those two ways. Um, the other thing to be aware of is that when you start out with the ruler designer, you're going to have the short reign penalty with your, your vassals. So on the one hand, if you were to play as the, you know, the Holy Roman Emperor, he has been in power for, in this case, actually, he hasn't ruled for very long, but you know, take someone like maybe the Caliph down here. The Caliph's been in power for quite a while, so most people are okay with him being the leader. But if you ruler design him, whoever you create is going to be brand new, and you have short reign penalties, so you are making that realm weaker than it would normally be. So just be prepared for a little bit of a challenge at the start, unless you give yourself a bunch of extra diplomacy, for instance, to try to offset that. So... Uh, that's just my, my mini tutorial to the ruler designer. Um, it's, it's a neat feature. I think it's worth the money. And um, if you have any questions, post them down below. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. So thank you so much for watching.